It's about time for positional tears. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Wednesday, January 25th. Frank Stample joined by Scotty Dubs. Scott White, today on the show, we're starting with first and third base tiers. Adalberto Mondesi was traded to the Boston Red Sox, so we'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. But Scotty, no joke, every year that we get to positional tiers, I get listeners, I get readers, I get people tweeting at me. People are excited for your tiers. Yes. And I'm yeah. excited too. Let's do it. I'm excited for them too. Tiers are kind of my thing. Uh, tiers are... Uh, I. I I don't think it's a stretch to say I, I popularized them in the, the the fantasy analysis world. I, I didn't make them up. I remember my AP calculus teacher talking about them back in the day uh, when I was in high school, obviously, and, and didn't have a career writing about fantasy sports. Um, so I know I didn't I didn't invent them, but I don't remember them being published everywhere until I started publishing them. So I think I think it is fair to say. I popularized them, and this is going back, you know, over 15 years at this point uh, when that started. And uh, part of the reason I'm I'm especially excited about them this year is because I I feel like for a while there I was going through the motions with them for for a few years, as we've talked about in other contexts, the juice ball era and and uh, how position scarcity kind of became less important because every position was was more or less equivalent in depth. But I, I think as we're coming out of that era and back into a, a more familiar, a more his, a more typical distribution, typical in a historical sense, uh, distribution of talent at each position, tiers are, are are back to mattering as much as they ever have. They are what help you stay on top of position scarcity and make sure that you're not neglecting any position as you're as you're filling out your roster on draft day. Before we get into the actual specifics of the tiers and the players, some people might be listening, Scott, and wonder, what are tiers? Like, cheer up, guys. Be happy. But if you had to explain it, if you had to break it down, uh, what are tiers and how do we use them for fantasy baseball? Yeah, so it's it's actually a pretty rudimentary thing. It's just grouping players uh that you think are more or less equivalent in value at each position. Though those are tiers. You're grouping them into tiers. So it, it's indicating like where the drop-offs are at each position. And uh like I said a minute ago, it's 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 a way to make sure that you're uh, you're drafting the position that's closest to a drop-off because you can see which position's active tier is closest to depletion if you have your positions organized into tiers instead of just rankings where, you know, obviously they, they show rankings to pick players in, in order of descending value, but a lot of times the value between number 12 and number 13 really isn't all that different. And, and so they belong in the same tier. So I, I feel like this is, and I've always felt like this is a more effective way to draft to, again, to ensure that you're taking advantage of position scarcity and not getting left behind anywhere when, um, you know, not getting left behind at a position where you can't afford to wait and in, and, and, and drafting a position where you can't afford to wait. You don't want to do that. And in, in tiers help, you to avoid doing that and they're really useful regardless of what kind of draft format you play in whether it's a snake draft or specifically for a salary cap or an auction type um the way that i would set it up personally is if you have your rankings just kind of like personal personal rankings set up on an excel sheet or wherever you, you group your players however you want to set it up color coded or put like a bold line between tiers whatever it might be cross the names off or delete them as they get drafted and then you'll start to see where the tiers are plentiful at certain positions and where they aren't. So you'll just be able to like track that throughout your draft. And it's really useful for salary cap and auction drafts for anyone who's played in that format. You'll notice that as you're getting to the end of a tier, like for example, we're going to talk about third baseman later on, Austin Riley, uh, Bobby Witt, Rafael Devers, Manny Machado. That's like a pretty clear tier in my opinion. Once you get down to that last player, if you're in a salary cap or an auction draft, 
that player is probably going to go for more money than the others did because everyone else knows the same. That's the last player in the tier. This is kind of like advanced level stuff for like auctions. And we'll talk about this as the season, as the off season goes on and talking about strategy and so on and so forth. But it's just something to keep in mind. I think tiers are really useful regardless of draft, but specifically uh, in those salary cap or, or auction type leagues. All right, Scotty, uh, let's jump in and, and just kind of a preamble again to all of this is the tiers are kind of a, it's a little taste before we get into the position previews, which we're going to do in February, where we're going to go more in depth on like every player and as many as we possibly can. Uh, but this is again, just kind of like grouping the players together and, and we'll, we'll break them down in, in that aspect. So it's, it's just a little taste, but don't worry. We're going to go deeper as, as, uh, as we get into February and March and all that fun stuff. Let's start with first base and we'll start with the elite tier here, Scotty. And these players are either being drafted in the first or the second round between an ADP of 10 and 23. According to Fantasy Pros, by the way, their ADP is up and running. Uh, Freddie Freeman, Vladimir Guerrero, Paul Goldschmidt, and Pete Alonzo. All four of those names finished inside the top 24 in Roto last season. Each of them averaged 3.2 fantasy points per game or better in head-to-head -head points leagues. The one I want to highlight here, Scott, is Paul Goldschmidt because he is... Obviously, you know, within this group, but he's going the latest of all of this, all of these names, and he was the best one last year. He was the second best hitter in fantasy behind only Aaron Judge, yet he's being drafted last of this group right now by ADP, 23rd overall. Why do you think that is? Because he's old. Yeah, probably. And and it's fair enough. I, I I've talked before about how uh, I don't hold age against pitchers so much because pitchers have so many other risk factors that it it seems it seems kind of silly to to um, fixate on that one. But hitters have fewer risk factors, and and one of the biggest I feel like for them is age. Paul Goldschmidt is is now thirty five years old, and regardless of what position a player plays, that's that's old. But He's coming off back-to-back -back years now that were basically MVP caliber after looking like he was going through a declining period before that. So that reassures me that, I mean, obviously the 2021 season wasn't a fluke because we just saw him do something very similar. In fact, even better last year. Um, so I, I, I don't think I'm being disingenuous when I say I would be just as happy with Paul Goldschmidt as my first baseman and any of those other free Freeman Guerrero or Alonzo. Uh, it's hard to say any of them have more upside because Goldschmidt was what the number two overall player in Roto leagues last year. Number two hitter behind only judge N number two hitter. Right. Um, Vladimir Guerrero was the number one hitter two years ago. Yep. And I think most people would say, Oh, he's the, he's the highest upside of these four. But, um, but they all have really high upside. They all have, I think, top five player in fantasy type upside. So this feels like a tier to me. Uh, I could understand some people leaving Goldschmidt out of it, but honestly, my first inclination when when I was uh, making putting together my first base rankings in October, I didn't see a... Considering Goldschmidt was the best of all of these guys this past year, I didn't see... I didn't immediately see a compelling reason to rank him anywhere but first at first base for next year. I since sobered on that idea. I do think there's more downside risk with Goldschmidt than there is for Freeman and Guerrero, which is why I now rank him third. But we're not talking about rankings where you're having to parse in that way. We're talking about tiers. And yes, Goldschmidt is absolutely part of this first tier. Yes, and I believe that he deserves to be part of that tier as well. Uh, I do think the reason he goes last of this group is because of the age as you mentioned scott 35 years old the stack has data there is some things there where last year goldschmidt hit 317 his expected batting average was 261 he slugged 578 his x slug was 482 so you know maybe he was a little bit lucky in terms of the results last season so could see some regression but he's still really good and hits in the middle of a great lineup with the st louis cardinals i will just point out scott for goldschmidt he kind of comes at an interesting point in the draft, at least early on in ADP here, where 23rd overall, he's just after Fernando Tatis, Mike Trout, some of those third basemen, and then he's right before uh, 
Francisco Lindor, JT Realmuto, Michael Harris, some of those second basemen, and then like Nolan Arenado. So it, it's kind of an interesting point in the draft. It's it's kind of like a, a dividing line for me where you have to decide, do I want Goldschmidt, even though I know first base is, you know, maybe a little bit deeper position, or do I just kind of look the other way and go with a second baseman or a Nolan Arenado or someone like that? Um, but yeah. I think more often than not, I'm probably not going to take Goldschmidt for that exact reason. Yeah, I'm probably not going to take a top tier first baseman either whether it's goldschmidt or or somebody else like pete alonzo uh you know part of part of um drafting by the tiers approach is knowing knowing uh the breakdown at each position ahead of time so that okay maybe paul goldschmidt is the last first baseman available of his tier from his tier at that point in the draft and that would normally suggests that's the guy to go for and then you look at second base and the top tier there still has Altuve, Simeon and Albies let's say all three but then you look at the next two tiers at second base I know we're not doing second base today but it's there's basically nobody there <laughs> um after the, the 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 top tier at second base well at first base um Certainly by the time you get to the, the third tier I have here today, the next best things, very, very deep in names that I'm, by the nature of the tiers, names that are more or less equivalent in my eyes. So I'd much rather uh, draft from that tier at first base than have to draft from that same tier at second base, where there's a lot more competition for very few players. Let's move on to the near elite tier at first base, and it includes one player. That is Matt Olson with a fourth round ADP of 38. And, you know, Olson, kind of like what I was just saying about Goldschmidt, more so within the first base position. Uh, Matt Olson is a dividing line because you had that elite tier going inside the first two rounds. Then you drop down a little bit. You have Matt Olson going in the fourth round. He's his own tier. And then you have to drop all the way down to pick 98, which is when you get your next first baseman, Scott. So that's. 60 spots worth of ADP. So, you know, Matt Olson's kind of on, on an island of his own. And he was fine last year. You know, the batting average was a disappointment, but he still had 34 home runs, 103 RBI. I think the bat, the batting average will bounce back, you know, one year under his belt in a new environment in Atlanta. But the same thing that I said about Goldie, I just don't see myself drafting much Matt Olson because he's going right around Nolan Arenado and Jose Altuve. And even Randy Rosarena, if you play in a five outfielder roto league and you want speed, kind of makes sense to go for someone like a Rosarena over Matt Olson. So uh, for those reasons, I think I'm probably not going to have a lot of him either. Yeah, and I'm, as we're having this discussion, I'm I'm a little concerned that the way I broke it down is going to um, is going to compel people to to draft a, a first baseman when maybe. There are when, when maybe other positions are higher priority. Uh, I did just kind of break down why you shouldn't do that by comparing first base to second base. But at the same time, I got Olsen in a tier here to himself, which makes sense for all the reasons you pointed out. I do think I do think he is a step behind the Pete Alonzo, Paul Goldschmidt's of the world, but a step ahead of the Jose Abreu, Vinny Pasquantino's of the world. Uh, but at the same time, I don't have much interest in drafting him because that tier with the Brayu and Pasquantino is so big. So, yeah, I basically agree with your assessment there. What I will say for for Olsen is uh, for the past several years, I've said basically that Pete Alonzo and, and, and Matt Olsen are mirror images of each other. And there'd be some times when one would have a better year and sometimes when another would have a better year. But regardless of that, I, I would, I would put them in the same tier the next year because uh, the underlying numbers look basically the same this year. I don't have them in the same tier this year. I think uh, there has been, uh, I, I, I do think a, uh, a separation has developed between the two because while they were both trending the right direction with strikeouts going from being big swing and miss guys to pretty good contact hitters uh, that changed last year. Ol uh, Alonzo continued to improve his strikeout rate 
while Olsen's regressed and regressed significantly in his first year with the Braves. And, and that pretty much explains the decline in batting average for him. Maybe he could cut down on the strikeouts again, but that's a hard thing to predict. And so I, I'm definitely at a point now where I prefer Alonzo to Olsen. And we now have a pretty large sample, Scott. 3,068 plate appearances for Matt Olson with a 23.6% strikeout rate. Last year, his strikeout rate was 24%. So it's pretty much right in line with his career average. Pete Alonso has been just under 20% strikeout rate two years in a row. And I think the batting average floor is safer. I think he's proven that the past couple of years. So I agree with you. I think uh, Alonso, higher batting average and... Uh, you know, probably similar power production, but I do think Pete Alonso is just a slight tick ahead of Matt Olson in that department as well. The next best things tier, and this is a tier that ranges nearly 50 picks worth of ADP, 98 through 144, and it is a massive one, as Scott has referenced multiple times. Jose Abreu, Vinny Pasquantino, Reese Hoskins, Nate Lowe, Christian Walker, CJ Crone, and Anthony Rizzo. Scott, I kind of look at this as, and I'm not, I don't want to complicate things, but like it's two tiers within one, at least based on ADP, Abreu, Pasquantino, Nate Lowe, those three are going right around pick 100. And then each of Hoskins, Walker, Crone, and Rizzo are going just a tad bit later, like pick 115 and beyond that. So I kind of look at it as two tiers within one. But specifically, I think the call between Vinny P and Jose Abreu is a really, really close one, right? Like, I can't fault anyone who you prefer because I like both of them. I do have Jose Abreu ranked just ahead of Vinny Pasquantino, but which way are you leaning? If you're on the clock around pick 100, you want to take a first baseman. Are you taking Vinny P or Jose Abreu? I love Vinny P, as you know, but I think I'm taking, if we're, if we're talking five by five scoring, like a Roto League, I think I'm taking Abreu just because, uh, I mean, that, that track record is, it's beyond reproach really i mean he's been such a consistent hitter such a uh so consistent for batting average especially and um i understand he hit only 15 home runs last year and, and very early on when the first adp data was coming out he it seemed like he was being heavily penalized for that uh, but then he signed with the astros and i don't know if it was just the fact he had a team again or it was the fact it was such a good team and such a favorable venue for a right-handed hitter. Uh, it, it seems like his his ADP has come back up to a rate that's a little more palatable, a little more deserved. And so uh, so Bray is close to getting the respect he deserves again. I don't think he's going to be a 15-homer guy in his first year with the Astros. I think that was one of the biggest statistical flukes of last season because he's still hit the ball as hard as he ever has, which is to say very, very hard. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Jose Abreu is a 300 hitter with 25 home runs in, in that lineup, 115 plus RBI. So I'll, I'll take him dis despite, despite uh, how much I like Pasquantino and what kind of potential I think he has. I'll, I'll take Abreu in that in that five by five scoring format. Now, if it's a points league, you know, part of the appeal for Pasquantino is the excellent plate discipline, how much he's going to walk, uh, how low the strikeout rate's going to be. I mean, strikeout rate's going to be low for Abreu too, but uh, it's going to be even better for Pasquantino. And I think that'll be enough to put him ahead in that format. But in either case, they're both in this tier, whether you're talking about five by five rotisserie scoring or head to head point scoring. That isn't true for every player, by the way. There are go we are not at first base. First base is pretty consistent between those two formats. But when we get to third base tiers, you'll notice some players are going to be a tier higher or lower, depending on what the scoring format is. Bobby Witt Jr. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, put a bow on Jose Abreu and Vinny Pasquantino. I think the skill sets are very similar at this point. You know, really good batting average, 270 plus, 20 to 25 home runs. There's a little give and take. Maybe you get more RBI from Jose Abreu because he's in the better lineup, but I do think Pat Fontina will get on base more, so maybe as a result, score a few more runs. So uh, they're very similar, but it's just, what do you prefer? Is it a little bit more RBI, a little bit more runs scored? 
uh, it's close. You know, you got the veteran versus the young buck, uh, but I do prefer Jose Abreu just by a hair myself. Uh, other um, name, before yep. we move on from this tier, because you you brought I I brought up how you know I, I wondered if putting Matt Olson in a tier by himself is going to encourage a lot of people to draft him when I probably won it. You brought up how this very large third tier could be two separate tiers. And so what I'm wondering aloud here, since, you know, this, this is kind of the, the first reveal of these tiers. They're not published on the site yet. Should I, instead of having Olsen tiered by himself, should I put Jose Abreu and Pasquantino in that tier together and have a, so, so you know, a, a second tier of three rather than one, and then have a third tier that consists of just Hoskins Nate Lowe, Christian Walker, CJ Crone, and Anthony Rizzo. Now, by ADP, that wouldn't look right, right? Because Olsen's going well ahead of Abreu and Pasquantino. But what I'm saying is, I don't like taking Olsen at the point where he's going, and I feel just as comfortable with Abreu and Pasquantino 60 picks later, uh, which will encourage people to draft more the way I think they should. I actually wouldn't, Scott. I agree with the way that you set it up here. And I think anyone who either listens to this podcast or maybe it's something you'll just note in the article that you put out for this will know not to target Matt Olson. Even though he's in his own tier, I agree that he should be because he's better than these names that we're talking about. And for as flawed as the batting seen. average was, Scott, last year, Olson, I believe, was a top 50 player in Roto. So he's still really, really good. Well, he was. Was he? Top 50? What, what was Abreu? 51st. Matt Olson was 51st last year. And Abreu had a down year, so probably. Yeah, he was 73rd, so yeah, not far off. But if I'm banking on Jose Abreu putting up that line I just gave, 300 batting average, 25 homers, 115 RBI, and I'm not counting on Olsen getting the strikeout rates back down and the batting average back up. I mean, maybe Abreu is going to have a better year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, then there's a legitimate argument for that. If you think he could put up that line, Scott, then Jose Abreu is going to return top 50 value. Um, and you won't ha you don't have to pay that price because he's going around pick 100. But if that's the point you want to make, then yeah, maybe that's something you should do. But as yeah, I'm going to think about this some more. I'm going to think I, about this. At my first thought, seeing the tiers, I thought it was set up correctly, just based on yeah. ADP um, yeah. and just kind of where their careers have trended recently. Like to me, That's, Matt Olson is still a, just a tick ahead of it. Of a it does look right this way. Yes. But as a draft guide, uh, as, as, as something meant to steer people the right direction strategically, the other way might, might might make more sense. Now I update my tiers. You know, this will be tiers 1.0. I'll have tiers 4.0 before it's done, so I'll have chances to rearrange it if I don't like uh, the way my the way I'm drafting my teams based on the way they're initially set up. So there will be chances to revisit it, but that's 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 something I'm going to have to think about. Well, maybe this last point that I'll make about this specific tier, Scott, the next best thing with that starts with Abreu and ends with Anthony Rizzo was that this is the exact point of this exercise is that I'm not really going to reach on an Abreu or Pasquantino as much as I like those guys because I'm perfectly fine getting Anthony Rizzo 50 picks later. And that's the point of tiers that yeah. if you think these guys are similar value, just wait for whoever goes last, you know, CJ Crone. You get them around pick 120, 125, or Rizzo 20 picks later. You know, Rizzo's getting up there in age, and you worry about missing time a little bit. But I think the batting average will get a little bit better with the shift ban, 30 plus home runs, and a great lineup with the Yankees. I don't mind just waiting and, and you know, taking whoever lasts from this group. So I think that's yeah. And that's, that's obviously what I was thinking when I set it up this way, too. Yeah. But. That hypothetical scenario I just laid out for Bray, that hypothetical stat line. I think that's his upside case that you're making, by the way, Scott. That's probably, at this point, like an 80th percentile outcome or better for Jose Bray. 
three hundred with twenty five homers. That's that's pretty. I awful. mean, look at his history. Yeah, and again, he didn't show decline. There. He didn't show true skills decline last year. I understand the home runs disappointed, but it seems like a total fluke. Uh, but Rizzo can't do that, right? I mean, Rizzo is probably going to hit no better than two forty. I mean, with the shift ban, maybe he's a beneficiary of that. But he's he's become so fly ball. He's become such a sellout for home runs at Yankee Stadium that I don't I don't think the shift ban's going to help Rizzo that much. So, and then look at all those other names. I mean, Pasquantino, the kind of breakthrough potential I think he has, what he showed after he got settled in at Kansas City. I mean, we're not going to do our breakouts episode right now, so we'll get into all the numbers later. But I do think upside-wise, there is more with Abreu and Pasquantino than there is with an Anthony Rizzo or a Christian Walker. Walker's a tough one for me to rank, Scott, because he he finishes as the 50th best player in fantasy last year, one spot better than Matt Olson, which <laughs> Christian Walker was awesome, and he actually underperformed his expected stats, and he was better in the second half. So everything's kind of pointing towards, you know, Christian Walker might just be a really, really good player. It's just he doesn't have that track record. He had one other season where he finished as a top 100 player. Yeah. I like him, but again, how much can you trust it? So. Walker to me is like a really hard player to rank or I guess even trust when you're talking about other names in this tier, uh, guys that I trust a little bit more. Uh, but your your point is valid on, on Anthony Rizzo. Like maybe he should be a tier lower, uh, but I've done a few drafts and I haven't, I don't mind winding up with Anthony Rizzo as my starting first base. I mean, Rizzo doesn't need to be in a different tier than the one hit wonders, Christian Walker and Nate Lowe. I think that's easy to say. It's just, uh, you know, what is the upside of Pasquantino? What is the upside of Abreu? Yeah. Um, you know, people are questioning my claim that Abreu is likely to hit 300 this year. I mean, he's at 302 of the past three years. He's a career 292 hitter. I mean, he, he just he just hit 304, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's not like maybe 300 is the most you should hope for, but you know. You know, he's not going to hit much less than than 290 in all likelihood. Yeah. Let's get into this next tier here, and that includes the fallback options with an ADP from 145 to 177. That includes Josh Bell, Andrew Vaughn, Rowdy Telez, and Ty France. Much like Anthony Rizzo, this is why I think you can argue either way that maybe Rizzo should be a tier lower or Rowdy Telez should be a tier higher because I don't really see much of a difference between either one. I know... Roddy Telez just hit 219, which was abysmal, but his expected batting average was 252. He hit 35 home runs. Now we have the shift restrictions. You know, maybe the power comes down a little bit, but mm -hmm. I expect the batting average to go up a little bit for Roddy Telez. And I, I kind of like him too. Again, I don't mind winding up with Roddy Telez. You kind of need that batting average buffer if you play in a roto league, but I, I don't mind just kind of waiting um, and getting Roddy Telez here as a fallback option, which you have aptly named this year. Yeah, and this was a tough. It, it was it was a it was difficult to find the the drop off here between the previous group with with Rizzo and Walker and this group with Josh Bell and Rowdy Telez, uh, because you know part of me wants to put them in the same tier too, uh, which is also a credit to the depth at first base. I would say that the drop offs aren't as clear here; that it is a little murkier in between tiers. And why we are kind of debating exactly where these tiers, how these tiers should look because, because of that murkiness. If we're comparing Telez in this lower tier versus uh, Rizzo in the higher tier specifically, yeah, they, they, had a ve they had very similar numbers last year and maybe they could do that again. Obviously, Rizzo has a history of doing these kinds of things and Rowdy Telez was... You know, this was the first time we see him put we we've, we've seen him put up these kinds of numbers. I think he's probably a greater threat to to fall into a platoon role, to slip into a platoon role with the Brewers than Rizzo is with the Yankees. So there's there's more downside risk with Telez, I would say, which is why I have him a tier lower than Rizzo. But uh, I do like the upside. I think I think he could be a guy who hits thirty plus home runs again. I he has that kind of power. Um, 
he impacts the ball that well. He makes pretty good contact for a guy with that kind of power. And for for hitting only 219, he had a 252 expected batting average. It was one of the biggest differences between expected batting average and actual batting average. And um, in his case, because he makes so much contact, it it does look like an example of a guy who could benefit from the shift ban. And I, I've said before that a shorthand way to to um, speculate, oh, maybe this guy could be helped by this ban, is is to look at that difference between expected adding, batting average and, and actual batting average. And Telez is a prime example of that. So is Christian Walker, by the way, who we were just talking about in the previous tier. Even though he's a right-handed hitter and we don't think of those guys being helped as much by a shift ban, he's a slow right-handed hitter who was shifted on a lot and didn't do very well on uh, the infield shift. And you see that big gap between expected batting average and actual batting average again. So um, I have more faith in Christian Walker than I do in in, uh, in Rowdy Telez when it comes down to it. but. But yeah, they're they're both they're both at a point where I could understand tiering them on either side of that line. The last name I'll mention in this tier is Andrew Vaughn, who's finally going to be playing his natural position at first base. We mentioned Jose Abreu now at the Astros. So Andrew Vaughn slides over to first for the White Sox, and he's consistently hit the ball hard in his major league career. It's the launch angle. We need him to uh, lessen those ground balls, a few more line drives, few more fly balls, but he makes a lot of contact. Andrew Vaughn does, and he hits the ball hard. And this is anecdotal more than anything, Scott, but a young player getting back to his natural position where he could focus more on hitting. He doesn't have to focus on learning to how to play the outfield. Or I think I heard the Welsh say last year, he saw Andrew Vaughn taking reps at second base at it, like in before a game. So I was just like, what is going on with all this? Um, I think Andrew Vaughn focusing on first base, he'll actually be able to do better as a hitter as well. But I don't have any evidence of that. It's just kind of it's just a theory. Yeah. It's a theory. And I've I've seen a few others share that theory. Uh there are, you know, we could point to examples in history where that's absolutely been the case. I, I have no idea whether it's going to be true of Vaughn or not. I always have wanted his uh his numbers, his data to look better than it has. You know, I, I've, I've, I'm always looking for what I can cite to say, aha, the, the breakout is happening for Vaughn because I still think he has high end potential, but I don't really see anything when I look through the data that, that makes for an easy case. Maybe it'll be that. Maybe it'll be just comfort level in his third season, no longer having to learn the outfield on the fly. But, uh, you know, it's it's only a theory at this point. All right, I want to skim over these next three tiers, Scotty, because I do want to give third base. It's, it's due time later on as well. The last resorts tier at first base, I think these are more corner infielders at this point. Jose Miranda, Jake Cronenworth, Ryan Mountcastle, Tristan Casas, Miguel Vargas, Brandon Drury, Joey Manessis, Luis Arise, and Will Myers. This is a really fun tier here, Scott. We've got young upside with Miranda, Casas, and Vargas. Uh, Ryan Mountcastle had awesome stat cast numbers last year, but he's got those terrible left field dimensions in Camden Yards. Joey Manessis was amazing for 56 games, but how much do we trust it? And Will Myers is really intriguing because he's an everyday player in Great American Ballpark, as long as he could stay healthy, theoretically. So... There are a lot of very interesting names in this group that I wouldn't mind as a corner or maybe, you know, utility or bench stash, something like that. Yep. Spoiler alert. Three of these players are in sleepers 1.0 for me. Nice. Which is, I mean, it's not much of a spoiler. It's up on the site right now. If you hadn't read it yet, you deserve to have it spoiled. (laughs) That's right. Uh, all right, well, let's quickly run through these last groups. Uh, deep Leaguers, Seth Brown, Josh Naylor, Matt Mervis, Joey Votto, Spencer Torkelson, Jared Walsh, and Brandon Belt. Two names up at the top, Seth Brown and Josh Naylor. They were actually both very solid in deeper leagues last year. So if you play in 15-team leagues as a corner, or uh, I think Seth Brown has outfield eligibility, someone you could target there as well. Yep. Still a ton of upside for Matt Mervis, likely to start the season in the minors, which completely 
breaks my heart. But uh, <laughs> if that, if not, if if it looked like he had the inside track for the Cubs, still he'd be up there with Casas and Vargas in the previous tier for me. Absolutely, and I still think that there is upside for Torkelson. I'm not going to completely write him off. I mean, this guy is a former top pick in the MLB draft, and maybe he got rushed to the majors a little bit, but. Uh, hopefully, you know, last season is behind him. He could learn from that. They change the dimensions in Comerica a little bit. So maybe that can help him get back on track. But I wouldn't write Torkelson off too quick because he's still super young and uh, there's lots of likes still. The leftovers, DJ LeMahieu, Trey Mancini, Luke Voigt, Wilmer Flores, and Carlos Santana. This tier is exactly what it sounds like, Scott. DJ LeMahieu's status is completely up in the air right now. He will avoid surgery on his broken toe, but it completely derailed his season last year and the Yankees have a glut of infielders. They're not all very good. Like Josh Donaldson, <laughs> for example, but I don't know. Like LeMahieu's status is just kind of up in the air for me right now. Yeah. I've moved him down just in the process of putting together these tiers because I think he'll play a fair amount. He'll, he'll get 400, 450 at bats, but you know, he hasn't actually done a lot with the at bats he's gotten since 2020, which is a while ago now. And um, the Yankees have a couple exciting young middle infielders expected to come up at some point this year and, and make it even harder for LeMahieu to nail down a full-time role. Yeah, uh, there's a chance that they could trade a Glaber Torres, but as you mentioned, they still have Os Oswald Peraza and Anthony Volpe and Josh Donaldson's on the team, Anthony Rizzo and all that fun stuff. So uh, again, those are Scott's first base tiers and uh, at some point this week, you'll be able to find them on the site. So keep a lookout for those. Before we hit the break, just do want to promote a quick thing here. Our buddy Nick Pollock of PitcherList has an online baseball convention called PitchCon, which starts today when you're listening to this, Wednesday, January 25th. It's four straight days of live streaming, all different sorts of panels, talking baseball, fantasy baseball, and everything in between. 100% of the donations will be sent directly to the ALS Association. So it's a great cause. If you can donate, go to pitcherlist.com slash pitchcon or twitch.tv slash pitchcon to watch or donate. I'll be on Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Scott will be on Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And our buddy Chris Towers will be on Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Little spoiler alert, but uh, Chris is doing a mascot draft with a couple of people so that should be a lot of fun if you want to uh go watch that this weekend PitchCon, support our buddy nick pollock from pitcher list uh and speaking of support support us go follow us on tiktok if you haven't done it already tiktok.com slash at fbt pod or just search fbt pod on tiktok let's take a break and we'll be back right after this Aren't you tired of the same old boring lives? Let's go to the Super Bowl. I'm in. On February 3rd. I'm taking this one. He's cute. Best friends. So you don't have any tickets. Let's make a run. Hey, what, no. let's go, Golden Girl. Get into the best trouble. Oh, thank you. These are good. Careful, they're high dosage. You here for the poker game? I'm Guy Fieri. If you did this to give us something to remember, it worked. 80 for Brady. Only in theaters February 3rd. Rated PG-13. New Sunday. My son works across town at Three Rock. Wait, isn't that a prison firefighting camp? Yeah, he's an inmate. Campfire's coming to you! You run into fires like a superhero. I didn't think that I was worthy of wearing a Cal Fire uniform. If you let me save your life, you'd be saving mine. Fire Country. Special episode Sunday after the AFC Championship game on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. All right, let's talk about some news and notes before we get to the third base tiers. Adalberto Mondesi was traded to the Red Sox in exchange for left-handed reliever Josh Taylor and a player to be named later. We know the deal when it comes to Mondesi. He's now 27 years old. He has the tools, but he strikes out a lot. He doesn't walk very much. He has not been able to stay on the field. He's coming mm -hmm. back from a torn ACL. Mondesi has played 50 total games over the past two seasons and has played more than 100 games just once in his career. Uh, the last time we saw him in extended for an extended time was the shortened 2020 season, where he was the fifth best shortstop and a top 30 overall player in Roto. So we know the type of upside he possesses possesses Scott. I don't know where he's at at this point coming back from <laughs> an ACL. What's the motivation like? He's going super late. His ADP is 251.7. 
What do you think about Mondesi to the Red Sox? I mean, I, I just don't think I, I don't think steals are going to be in as high demand anymore because of the the rule changes as we've talked about all off season. So I don't see much incentive to sell out for the upside given the risk. And and going to the Red Sox doesn't change anything uh, in in terms of Mondesi's value. What's funny is like they only need to keep the they 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 only have a shortstop void until Trevor Story is ready to return from elbow surgery mid season, but you can't feel confident Mondesi is going to make it even that long. You know, it's just they get they they filled one injury headache with another. Yeah, I, I mean that's well put, Scott. It's. It's Adalberto Mondesi. We don't know what he's going to look like. Is he going to play in spring training? Still kind of coming back from that torn ACL. So uh, there's a lot up in the air. You know, some people will talk themselves into him for the speed or whatever. But look, it's low risk. It's ADP is 250. If you want to take a shot as like a bench player, that's fine. But just, you know, be wary. I, I would not be expecting much at all from Adalberto Mondesi. Mike Levenger is being investigated by Major League Baseball due to allegations of domestic violence and child abuse. He signed with the White Sox this offseason. So as we get more news, we'll let you know what's going on with Mike Levenger. Mets third base prospect Brett Beatty is likely to begin the season in the minors. They did not sign Carlos Correa, so it sounds like Eduardo Escobar will start the season as the third baseman for the Mets. Jesus Aguilar signed a one-year, $3 million deal with the Oakland A's. Not much to see here. It's got the A's lineup. They are now fielding a combined group of Tony Kemp, Jace Peterson, Aledmus Diaz, and Jesus Aguilar. It's pretty gross. That is rough. Yes. Yeah. If you're looking for pitchers to stream this year, I mean, the Oakland A's are... Got if they're not the top of the list, they are. They're right up there. They are close to. I mean, we're we're saying this about them last year too. After they traded Olsen, anyway. Yeah. I mean. Yikes. Yeah, not a, not a lot going on there. The Marlins are no longer pursuing Yuli Gurriel, according to Craig Mish, who I actually had lunch with when I was down in Florida. Great guy. Highly recommend. Follow him on Twitter at Craig Mish. <laughs> uh, the Phillies invited each of their top three pitching prospects to Major League Camp: Andrew Painter, Mick Abel and Griff McGarry, there is a real chance that Andrew Painter is in the opening day rotation, which would be crazy. I, I, he's either 19 or turning 20 years old. He's he's really young. Joey Votto is likely going to be delayed at the start of spring training, coming back from a torn rotator cuff and torn biceps. Lastly, congrats to Scott Rowland on being elected to the Hall of Fame, joining Fred McGriff as the class of 2023. Todd Helton and Billy Wagner fell just short at 72% and 68% respectively. Uh, Andrew Jones, guy, I don't know. Are you a big Andrew Jones guy? I kind of feel like you have to be, right, as a Braves fan? There are bigger Andrew Jones guys, but sure, I yeah. like Andrew Jones. Well, he took a huge jump. I think he went from 40 to 58%. I am yeah. rooting for Andrew Jones to get into the Hall of Fame. I, I think if someone like Scott Rowland is getting in, to me, they're very similar players in that they were never – there were seasons where they were – very good offensively. There's no doubt about that, but they were more so known for their defense. And Andrew Jones, my opinion was one of the best defensive center fielders I've ever seen. So I, I, I think, yeah, I, I mean, there's a case. He is the best defensive center fielder ever. Right. I struggle with the, 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 um, you know, the fact he was basically done by age 30. Yeah. Uh, sure. and, and so, you know, it, it makes him more of a fringe case than maybe he was shaping up to be. So I haven't been as adamant that he belongs as, as others are. But my my take on it is, is and obviously I don't have a vote, but if I did, um, if, a, if a guy's percentage has been continually increasing, and I'm at least on the fence about him, you know, and it's now to the point where my vote could be the difference between him getting in or not. I would just vote for him. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I would rather see, I, I would rather be the reason people get in than not get in again. If, it's, if I'm on the, if I'm on the fence about it anyway, if it's somebody who I think absolutely doesn't belong. Okay. But it's rare that somebody's going to get that big a percentage of the vote. And I'll be like, absolutely no way on it you now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're fans. Let's go. Let's get Andrew Jones in the Hall of Fame. Carlos Beltran, first year on the ballot, 46 and a half percent. 
they'll get in one day. I, I feel pretty confident saying that. Let's take a look at Scott's third base tiers. There is one that I've never seen before. The unmatched tier. That includes one player. No surprise. Jose Ramirez with an ADP of 2.3. He is in a class of his own when it comes to the third base position. If you have a top three pick, regardless of format, feel perfectly fine using it on Jose Ramirez. He has finished no lower than sixth overall in Roto each of the past three seasons. Last year, he averaged 3.8 fantasy points per game. He's about as elite as they come. He did slow down a little bit in the second half last year. Turns out he was playing with a torn ligament in his thumb, Scott. He had surgery in the offseason. Real quick, does does that concern you one bit when it comes to you know using a top three pick on Jose Ramirez? No, it doesn't. Uh, for what it's worth, this tier above the elite, I've broken it out on occasion for certain positions in certain years. I didn't need to it anywhere last year just because of the way the names broke down. But, you know, basically, I, I, I'm wanting to distinguish Jose Ramirez from like the top tier at first base where you've got like Vladimir Guerrero, Freddie Freeman, like we talked about. There's a there's really no case to make for drafting Guerrero ahead of Ramirez, let's say. And so if I put them in the same tier, obviously it's separate positions, but in, in the elite tier, um, that that's almost saying, oh, well, you could draft these guys equivalently even at separate positions. And, and that's not the case. Jose Ramirez is one of those players who needs to be among the top five draft picks and, uh, and you'll probably see this tier at other positions that also have players like that. All right, well, let's take a look at the elite tier, which includes second and third round players with an ADP between 14 and 35. Rafael Devers, Manny Machado, Austin Riley, Bobby Witt, and Nolan Arenado. Worth noting that Bobby Witt is one tier lower in a head-to-head -head points league, which Scott mentioned earlier. There would be a few players that uh, their value is differentiated uh, based on the different formats. The Fantasy Pros ADP, Scott, I mentioned we have three different sources now. I think it's RT Sports, NFBC, and Fantrax. At some point, CBS, Yahoo, ESPN, those will all be involved in Fantasy Pros ADP as well. Three mm -hmm. different sources moves Bobby Witt down to 15.3. I knew it was going to happen. I Does knew it. I knew NFBC was okay. way too high on him. They have him. And, and we've been talking about this. They have Bobby Witt as the, uh, where is he? I'm losing. They have him as the seventh overall player. But yeah. you get a couple other sources in there, and suddenly he drops to 15. You get three more sources there who aren't NFBC, like in their thinking. Then he's going to drop even more, probably drop more to a range where I rank him. And we can all go home happy at that point. <laughs> Uh, all right, I wanted to ask you specifically about Devers, Machado, and Austin Riley. Those are names that I consistently see at the turn, early second round picks, something like that. Because of that position, position scarcity, Scott, are you taking those three names, Devers, Machado, Riley, over guys like Vladimir Guerrero or Bo Bichette, where they are still really valuable players, but they come at more plentiful positions like first base and shortstop? Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. In fact, I have Devers as a first rounder. I may have Machado as a first rounder in in one format or another too, uh, just to really drive home that point. Um, and it'll become clear why when we get to the next tier at this position, because this is a pretty robust tier, right? Five players, no other position. Uh, well, first base doesn't, and a few of the positions we're going to talk about as we move forward. This with this with this is going to have an elite tier as big as five players. So, you know, if you just look at that tier independent of all the others, you'll say, ah, third base is deep. I can wait forever here. But this tier of five is depleted by the end of round two. Well, Nolan Arenado's in it. So maybe it, maybe it trickles into round three. Um, but it's, you know, it's gone pretty early on. And after that, after that, it's pretty scary. Yeah, and I think we're, I've already seen it in other drafts, Scott. I'm in a slow draft for the NFBC right now. It's a 15-team league. Alex Bregman went in the third round, pick 39. Now, I'm not advocating for doing that, but that is clearly someone who is worried about missing out on third base. And yeah. the next one after that is, is Gunnar Henderson by ADP. 
And, you know, we'll talk about these guys coming up, but, you know, where two rounds later, it's in the fifth round. Gunnar Henderson hasn't gone yet. So we'll talk about that. But I, I think that's just to drive home the point that people want a good third baseman this year. And there's not many of them. So well, keep that in mind. And, and to give an example that I think is more typical from our latest mock draft earlier this week, 12 team Roto. Um, so you had, you had, uh, that this tier of five. Okay. So the top four in the tier, Austin Riley, Bobby Witt, they were all gone within the first 18 picks of the draft. Yep. And then Nolan Arenado went with the 27th pick of the draft. So the tier was depleted at that point after 27 picks, the next third baseman didn't go off the board for four rounds. It was Bregman, uh, but it was, you know, more like pick 70 or whatever, which I, I think is going to be more typical. And with that, Scott, we'll move into that next tier, the near elite, which is just one player. It's Alex Bregman, who you mentioned, who has an ADP of 64.3 uh, in the sixth round. Now, I know exactly but, what you're about to say, Scott. Yeah, He's one tier lower in a categories league. Right. Right. He's one tier lower. In, he's, he's one of those players who... Uh, you know, I, I put him in the near elite tier here because uh, that's reflected for points leagues. Mm -hmm. But I have a little cross, a little dagger indicator uh, <laughs> next to him that says, oh, but if you're talking Roto leagues, drop him, drop him a tier, which would mean in Roto leagues, there are no third basemen in the near elite tier. The tier is completely skipped in that scoring format which is why it is so vitally important to grab one of those five elite third basemen, presuming you don't get uh, Jose Ramirez at the, near the very start of your draft. And I think the more people listen to content and do mock drafts this offseason, I think they're going to realize what's going on at the third base position. Alex Bregman is going to get pushed up, Scott. I think by the time we get to March, Bregman is going to be a fifth round pick. He's going to be inside the top 60 picks in 12 team leagues. I think, for this reason, well, he's not he's not going to go three to four rounds after Nolan Arenado. I, I just personally don't think it's going to happen. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, here's here's the thing. Like, okay, in a points league where I do actually have him in the near elite tier, yeah, I could understand it. His play discipline's so good. Maybe he could keep up with the Nolan Arenados of the world, or at least come close. But in a categories league, I'm not so sure he deserves to be ranked ahead of Gunnar Henderson. So why would Bregman get pushed up and not Henderson as well? They both could be. I, I think that's totally plausible. I think people might look at the second half for Bregman where he hit 287 with an 894 OPS. He raised his fly ball rate, hit a few more home runs in the second half as well, as maybe this is something that can carry over. You know, if he can hit 270 with 25 home runs, that's a pretty valuable player at a really scarce position. So that might be worthy of a top 60 pick, even in a category, uh, categories league. Um. Yeah, I, I mean, it's like, it, I, I don't want to reach that much. Yeah. You know, it's, it's. I'm not advocating it, the, Scott. I'm just, I'm making a prediction. I think that's what's going to yeah. happen as we get closer. Like, I, I wouldn't change my tiers to reflect that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like, if your tiers are just a reflection of ADP or your rank or your rankings, then they're not. This is getting back to the first base discussion. Do we tier Olsen with Pasquantino and Abreu, even though they're going well after him? Um, tiers are meant to reflect different things than ADP. It's supposed to reflect your own comfort level, and you're kind of supposed to ignore ADP when it comes to putting them together. So it wouldn't change even if Bregman and Henderson did get artificially inflated because of the scarcity at third base. Uh you know, ultimately you want good players and you want, you want you. Yes. It makes sense to prioritize the good players at the position that runs out of them the soonest, but that doesn't mean when it's already out of good players, you settle for not as good players when there are still good players elsewhere. No, I, I think that's a, that's a good way to put it too. And it's something you talked about when we reviewed the mock draft where, Instead of getting your second outfielder at the time, you took Willie Adamas just because you felt like Willie Adamas was that much better than the outfielders available. So it's you know it's a, it's a good way to put it. The next tier here is the next big big thing, the next best things rather, which includes Gunnar Henderson and Max Muncie. And there's a big ADP range between these two. Gunnar Henderson going at pick 92, Max Muncie at pick 142. Scott, based on this tier's approach and the way that you've explained it the entire night. 
you're probably not going to wind up with any Henderson if you can get Max Muncy 50 picks later. Yeah, I mean, probably not. But that's that's a dangerous game to play when you when you're leaving yourself only one player in a tier. And and if you start comparing that to ADP and like, oh, I can wait until 140 to take him, but he's the last player in the tier. Yeah. Then all it takes is one other person in the draft going off, you know, ignoring ADP and just taking Muncie when they feel like they want third base or second base and even weaker position. That's where he's exactly what I was going to say is that Muncie's dual position eligibility makes it even tougher to rely on him as the last player in the tier. So I, I guess the the broader idea with this example is, um, you know, I ideally you can wait until the very last player in a tier to draft at that position, but a little buffer isn't so bad either. And so we have a tier here of three. Let's put Bregman in it. Bregman, Henderson, and Muncie. If Bregman's gone and there's only two players left at the tier, um, I'm going to be thinking about taking Henderson. I'm not going to necessarily wait until he's gone and then take Muncie. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. I mean, it's it's so tough uh, with, with, with this position. So, um, and, you know, there's just such a big range in the ADP too, which I spoke about. Uh, and we could talk about the next group too, which kind of starts. Some of these names are actually going before Max Muncie. So someone like, I believe it's, Anthony, no, not Anthony Rendon. It's Matt Chapman. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Chapman is going at 149. Suarez is the one that's actually going at 132. So the fallback options tier includes Rendon, Anthony Rendon, Eugenio Suarez, and Matt Chapman. And this is a group that ranges from 132 to 230. So that tells me, Scott, that drafters don't think that there is a huge difference, at least based on ADP, between Suarez, Chapman, and Max Muncy, they also do not agree uh, with Anthony Rendon. Like the market is completely out. His ADP is mm-hmm. 230. He's been buried. People are done with Anthony Rendon. He has not been able to stay healthy. He's played 105 games over the past two seasons. So what do you think about those two statements? The market is out on Rendon, and they basically see Suarez, Chapman, and Muncy all as very similar players. I get why they would think of Muncy as similar to Suarez and Chapman. Uh, he walks a lot more. He's in the best lineup of the three. Um, certainly his points league value is higher than the other two. But if we're, we're, you know, I have him tiered ahead even in a five by five context. I think for me, the fact he's dual eligible at second base and even weaker position, as I just mentioned, uh, makes me want him that much more than Suarez and Chapman because you know even if you're drafting him with with the idea of playing him at third base you have no idea how the year is going to play out and you may end up you may end up finding some awesome third baseman nobody sees coming up like Brett Beatty gets called up at some point and goes crazy and you added him off the waiver wire well good thing you can shift Muncie to second base where uh you know maybe Cattell Marte got hurt again the guy you drafted to fill that spot so it's it's a it's a valuable thing uh, I, 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 I mean, Max Muncy's the highest end bat who is eligible at those two weakest positions, right? So that's enough, I think, to prioritize him over Suarez and, and Chapman in a way that's not reflected by ADP. As for Rendon, the market, his market being gone, I understand why. I'm not excited to draft him either, but. We need chances at this position. You know, we need we need to find pockets of upside. And just given his history, there's there's reason to think he has upside in a way um, that most anyone else remaining at the position would not. It's the desperation at third base encourages a glass half full approach with Rendon. That's I think that's probably the best way of putting it. And so the fact that everybody's out on him, I, I think it, it makes it only easier to take a shot on him. Um, 
And, you know, maybe that means wait until Suarez and Chapman go off the board. And, and, and at that point you could think about drafting Rendon probably for very cheap. Yep. Um, glass half full. You mentioned for Rendon batting behind both Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. Two yeah. of the best hitters in baseball. So, I mean, it's, it's obvious health has played a role in his demise and oh, for sure. I, I, I think there's reason to think he's declined even apart from that, but you know, he needs a good sample of a bats to say for sure. The last resorts tier includes Jose Miranda, Brandon Drury, Josh Young, and Key Brian Hayes. As I mentioned um, at first base, Miranda and Josh Young this time, those are the kind of young upside -y type guys that you can find at the spot. If Josh Young can cut down the strikeouts, we could see a decent batting average with, you know, 20 plus home runs. I I feel similarly about Jose Miranda as well. Scott, I don't know what to do with Brian Hayes at this point. 20 steals from a third baseman is awesome getting those out of position steals, but a 244 batting average with five home runs. That is, I mean, we're talking about the, the power of Luis Arise and, you know, the batting average of some crappy catcher. It's, it's, it's bad. It's bad for Cabrian Hazy. He hits the ball really hard, but a lot of it is into the ground. He's got a 3.9% barrel rate. I yeah. I just don't know how the power gets much better. Like maybe I don't either. homers, but I'm surprised there's so much enthusiasm for him. And I, I mean, there was a time a couple years ago when I was leading the Cabrian Hayes parade Yeah. Uh, because over a small sample in 2020, he looked like he had figured out how to maximize that power. Well, it's been, Two years of a much larger sample, much, much larger sample that suggests not even close. He does run more than most third basemen, though that could change again because I think the whole stolen base landscape is about to change. So I I, I actually had him ranked even much lower than this um, and then just decided I was I was so far out on a limb with that that. I could afford to move him up a little into this tier and still be the low guy on him. So that's basically where I stand with Cabrian Hayes. I, you know, I, I think Brandon Drury's probably not going to amount to much with the angels this year, but I, I'd, I'd rather gamble on him because, uh, you know, that's still a pretty good hitters park that he's going to better than San Diego where he finished last year. So I, I think there's at least a chance Drury's a 20 to 25 Homer guy. I think there's a much more chance of that than Hayes being, a 20 to 25 homer guy. All right. The deep leaguers includes Justin Turner, Josh Rojas, John Birdie, Patrick Wisdom, Alec Bohm, Jordan Walker, Ryan McMahon, and Yandy Diaz. Scott, let me know what you think of this little strategy here. Say you just, you've missed out on everything, right? Last couple of rounds of your draft. Take pairing Jordan Walker with a Justin Turner. So we don't know if Jordan Walker is going to be up on opening day but he's a young prospect with a bunch of upside. And then Justin Turner is kind of just that steady veteran, high floor kind of player. Take Justin Turner, however much he'll give you. And then, you know, hopefully when Jordan Walker comes up, he kind of just takes over. What do you think about pairing Jordan Walker with like just a stable veteran to start the season? Yeah, I think that's fine. Even though I rank him lower like Jordan Walker is the linchpin to that plan. So he's the one you should probably draft first. And if you don't end up with Justin Turner, cause somebody else jumps in there before your last pick, whatever you pair Jordan Walker with Ryan McMahon instead. I mean, that's, that's basically the same plan, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, that's, that's pretty basic draft strategy is in the late rounds, you prioritize upside and, uh, if you just need a, a short-term fill-in waiting around for that upside or waiting to see if it's going to come through for you, then it doesn't so much matter who that other player is. Alec Bohm, I just want to give him a shout-out. I know he's pretty boring, but a 280 batting average last year, solid counting stats, he's going to hit in the middle of the Phillies lineup. If you play in a deeper league where you want to just prioritize at-bats that aren't going to hurt you, I think Alec Bohm is probably one of those players. Scott, this leftovers tier is filled with a bunch of names. Is there anyone here that stands out above the rest that you'd like to mention? Uh, Spencer Steer is, you know, kind of interesting in a deep league. If he can earn every day at bats with the Reds, obviously a fantastic ballpark to hit in. So he's yeah, I, I think Spencer Steer. Like. 
I think Spencer Steer could could be Jonathan India like. Uh, I think they have similar batting profiles and obviously play in the same hitter friendly venue. Uh, the one who stands out the most to me though is Brett Beatty. I think Brett Beatty's got got kind of a post type sleeper thing going on because he came up with a fair amount of hype and and he homered in his first game, right? That sounds um, right. I think so. And then he very quickly suffered an injury that ended the season. And then the Mets were replacing him. We're, we're blocking him with Carlos Correa this off season. Ultimately that deal didn't end up happening, but um, it kind of moved people's attention away from Brett Beatty. And, and it doesn't seem to be on him right now. And you mentioned earlier in the show that he's probably not going to be on the opening day roster. That's fine. He will be the Mets starting third baseman soon enough, I would say. And, um, Impressive minor league numbers, as you'd expect for a prospect of his caliber. But in the brief time he was up in the majors, hit the ball very hard with a high contact rate and hit it very hard against same-handed pitchers too, lefty on lefty, which is not so common for somebody so young. So Brett Beatty has a ton of upside, and if it looked like he had a clearer path to at-bats, he'd be a couple tiers higher. He'd be up there with Josh Young, probably of the Rangers. All right, if you want a visual element of these tiers, first base and third base, you'll be able to find them on cbssports.com slash fantasy slash baseball. And we've got a whole bunch of other shows coming out. Second base and shortstop, outfield tiers, starting pitcher tiers. We'll do all of it over the next couple of weeks. We're going to wrap there. For Scott, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>